Hi there, I'm your host, Clive Sirkin, and welcome to the Unstuck Podcast, where we're on a journey to help you get control of your work environment, get yourself unstuck, and perform to your full potential. So today, uh, my guest is an old, like, I think I can call you an old friend, uh, a young old friend, a uh, former colleague of mine in the current CMO of Kraken, Mayor Gupta. Welcome, my friend. Thanks, Clive. And I thought you would call me a bestie. Your bestie. One of my good friends. I mean, Maya and I go back uh, 2008, 9, 12. When was it? That? 2012. Yeah, sometimes you're in the KC Eastern. So we've been around each other for a long time. Um, interesting story. So you um, bill yourself as an engineer turned CMO. So the best, as I recall, and you'll have to correct me on the facts, you studied English uh, uh, undergrad English, and then you did a uh, engineering degree, uh, and you went to Sapient and Nitro. Yep. Sapient Nitro, and you spent about 10, 11, 12 years there. And during that time, you transitioned from a coder to, you know, to, to building capability, but you pivoted and then moved to KC, and that's when we got to know each other, and, and we had a ball as far as I recall. Um, and then you went on from Spotify, Gannett and Spotify and now crack. And so you've had a really interesting career. Um, and I'd love to talk about the choices you made or the choices that were made for you or the doors that opened and why you went through the doors. And just let's reflect on the journey because, you know, there's a lot to learn in choices and there's a lot to learn in how people move through their careers and why they make those choices. So Let's start the journey and we'll see where it takes us. Yeah, no, it's thank you. And um, I'm glad you mentioned that the choices I made are to be very candid choices that were made for me. And thankfully, uh, good choices, which back then I didn't even realize were were good enough. But, um, you know, I grew up in India and I think I'll do justice if I went all the way back. So grew up in India. And uh, you mentioned English, which often doesn't get spoken about. But yes, I was I was a loose cannon. I had no clue what I wanted in life, let alone career or let alone, uh, you know, I was a good student. I was, uh, you know, I was big time into sports. And a decent tennis player, as, as I recall. Decent tennis player, like every other Indian kid, wanted to play cricket for the country. And uh, up until you realize that, okay, there are a billion more like me, uh, so it'll be hard. Uh, and uh, went, almost joined the army. Um, I don't know if I ever shared that. Um, at the last moment, got cold feet. Uh, they rejected the whole batch and uh, didn't know anything better. And I was lost and um, there was nothing else left. So did did uh, my undergrad in Delhi University. But thankfully, you know, there was one way to get a job in India back then. Uh, it was to get into computer science. And my mom had a big role to play in that. And I won't even claim that I was passionate about engineering and computer science, but that was the way to get a job, get a gig uh, back then in India. So did my major in computer science, and uh, that was the first pivot in my life, and then started at Sapient, um, which is great. Uh, Java, j wore all kinds of hats, and uh, when you're a young kid coming out of a country like India, you uh, sometimes you work 24 hours. So did a lot of that, learned with, from some incredible leaders who are still there and mentors of mine. Uh, my core values were based there. The, the second pivot, which was actually essentially the, the real professional pivot for me, happened in 2006 when Sapien acquired an ad tech product. And one of my mentors asked me to be a product lead. That was the first time I entered the world of marketing and advertising from pure engineering, but building products for marketing and advertising. And it, I kid you not, that was um, I came to Miami for the first time then because the company was based here. I would go back to my hotel because I was traveling and I would read Wikipedia about what is an advertiser, what's a pixel, you know, what is a target, what's a publisher, because that was the only place that had marketing for dummies. Everything else was too complex for me to understand. So that's how I started from a very bottom up, you know, building ad servers. So I actually coded ad servers, search with management systems back then. And then from there, thankfully, just been taking some small baby steps until the second pivot came. When I finally left Sapien after 12 years in 2012 to join Kimberly Clark, thanks to some very disruptive leaders back then and, you know, Fortune 100s who could think further than most people. And, uh, 
you know, my biggest learning going to the brand side in the so-called corporate America for the first time was um, it made me realize that when I was a technologist, I was like a hammer looking for a nail. You know, we were we were a solution looking for a problem. Whereas when I went to KC and worked with you and many others, I, I realized that at the end of the day, it was all about understanding the human problem uh, and uh, and whatever you could do as a business, as a brand to solve it and remove the friction from their lives. And you had to use technology and data and science as an enabler to do that. When you do that and you inspire behavior, that's when growth happens. That's when you drive change. So did that, was very fortunate to have worked on brands like Spotify after that. And, you know, and since then it's been Perhaps after that, I can say I've made some conscious choices. Before that, it's just been a fortunate ride. It's interesting. We, let's go. You, you brought up one of the two things that I wanted to talk about during our ride at Kimberly Clark. Um, one was this notion that we believe that what we were doing as marketeers and as a business was trying to find out what the human problem was that was preventing us from making money and to really understand um, at a very basic level, um, human behavior and, and be students of behavioral science and then apply solutions to it, of which some of it was technology driven and, and data driven. And we were, we were maniacal about it in learning at the same time. That was 2012. So now fast forward 10 or so years later, I'm curious to go, was, were we on the right track? Did, were we thinking about it right? And has it held the test of time as you've gone through your career. And then I want to come back to the other famous one, which I think you'll know. Uh, but let's talk about that one for a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pulled me on the second one. I was about to say it. Um, yeah, I think both of those, which we'll talk about the second one in a moment, but I actually feel the, the first principles of driving growth, growing businesses, driving change haven't changed. You know, the means have changed. The, the human habits and consumer behaviors have, have changed dramatically. And the pace at which they change now is much faster. You know, back then, mobile took us so long. Digital took us so long. Uh, but now, you know, mobile became a friction. Then voice came about. Voice became a friction, AI and ML. So the pace at which we are adopting new technology and habits is much faster. But there's no question that that key insight that I learned from you, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's at the end still valid. It's all about what is that human behavior uh, that is preventing your growth? And that's a very hard question. That's a very hard question to unravel. And I remember this one analogy, I've used it so many times, which I'll never forget, which was um, the Depend story, which was one of our incontinence brands and the disruptor, the innovator of the category. But um, but, you know, as, as we stayed around, uh, things started to shift and uh, we were losing market share. Competitors were coming along and there was a lot of research being done, a lot of product innovation, a lot of data. But at the end, uh, I know that you had sponsored behavioral science. We invested a lot of money to really figure out what was happening. And it was all about, um, it wasn't about the product, but it was more about the perception and the stigma associated with being seen buying an incontinence product on the aisle, which led to, okay, well, how do you address that? We address that with marketing, but we also address that with innovating the business model, you know, launching, trying to launch subscriptions. So you're never seen buying the product, but also through marketing and storytelling, de-stigmatizing a category which has had that stigma for, for decades. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that vividly. And, and the technical solution was absorption, right? But the reality, yeah. the human solution was protecting people's dignity. Yeah. And when you flip that around and you, and you understand that what you are about is restoring dignity, um, it changes all of the things you do and the way you talk about the things you do. And, and you know, it's like for me, um, there was such a big fundamental shift at the time. Because if you think about it, Kimberly Clark had these amazing brands, as you said, Depend, Huggies, Kleenex, you know, and yes, to a degree, the product had suffered because of quarterly pressures and burning the furniture and taking money out of product development. So we, we, we obviously put money back in and got the product to where it needed to be. But that gets you only so far. It gets you the right to play. Um, and then when you get in, it's like the differentiation is two things in my mind. One is really understanding that 
the human reality and the other one is moving fast. And I know um, it's a relative term, right? And you alluded to this, that things are changing. And if I go back in my 30 years, every year I would say one thing, it was always true, which is things are moving faster now than they've ever moved before. And that'll always be true. And I think speed is such an important part of the equation. As you've gone into, I say, less legacy businesses, Spotify certainly cracked, and I would assume that still holds true, the notion of speed. It is, it is very true. Um, but then as once you pick up speed, you then realize that your uh, next level of maturity is the differentiation between speed and velocity. Uh, which is, of course, a lot of, you know, disruptors and tech startups, which now become iconic brands, speed is a genesis, you know, because you believe that the desire, the need for speed is much stronger than the desire for perfection. Whereas when you're a legacy brand, you're just too afraid and you want to get it right. You don't want to fail. So no question about that. But then it's also very important to be watchful that you're not just running fast, but in the wrong direction always. So it's also very important that balance of bottom up and top down. When you are a startup, you know, 20 people, it's very easy to be bottom up. It doesn't matter where you're going because no matter what you do, it is incremental. But then once you get to a certain scale and you've proven your product market fit and you're going from one to end, I think that's when you do need some framework. Do you do need some 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 ways to make decisions? And in fact, at that stage, what is more important is to have the ability to make decisions for things you will not do. You choose not to do versus the ones that you choose to do because that ability to say no to good ideas is what actually makes you a great brand and a great business. I think that's such an incredibly important point on, on many levels, the notion of choosing not what to do or, um, or choosing what not to do. Um, I think on two levels, one is, is I think about, particularly now as, as, as we're, you know, with Screen Dragon, where we're going into organizations to help them um, move through the system to, to remove process friction. Um, one of the things that I consistently see is, and the best way I can describe it is organizations putting rocks into their employees' backpacks. <laughs> so the more every day they come to work, there's another rock that's put in their backpack and they're carrying this massive load and spend more time managing the beast and being held back through what I would call process friction or institutional work that doesn't add any value um, to those are the blue angels flying by if we hear the noise um, to um, slow them down. So then people like all their energy is managing the beast and not getting outcomes. And so as you think about your experiences, like how do you and then the other sorry, the other point is unlearning because mm-hmm. organizations, especially ones with duration, but even, you know, I'm not series D growth organizations. At some point, you get to a point where there's institutional knowledge and the ability to kill unproductive work or institutional work product or unlearn things becomes so crucial in my view. And I don't know how, if you have experienced that and what's your view on that? Yes, all the time. I think unlearning is a great point. Um, I feel that the biggest challenge for any organization, agnostic of what scale and what stage, is when bad habits lead to growth, when bad habits lead to success, because that makes it very hard for you to unlearn. Um, Until until you you bring this mindset of constant healthy paranoia that your ability, that that moving forward, you know, this this unfortunate mindset, and I know that this is one of your phrases that you've used, you'll be amazed how many of these phrases I still remember, is the ability to think, that staying where you are is less risky than moving forward or moving forward is more risky than staying where you are. But I think great growth brands and great growth businesses are constantly self-disrupting. You know, they, are, they believe that the only moat you have as a business today is your ability to move forward and faster versus any level of data, any level of technology There is no moat in the business today. If you have a great technology, if you have a great science, if you have access to those users, there is somebody else building another product that either will give you more value for the same price or same value for a lower price. So the only way 
you continue to give yourself a chance to keep that customer is on one hand, keep innovating and keep adding incremental value every single time and, and do that with speed and velocity. It's, it's incredible. And I'm, you know, you bring, you bring back a lot of like old memories, but that notion of um, fear paralyzes came out of this. I never fully understood when I looked at my clients, when I was in the agency business or at that time during Kimberly Clark or any of my experiences, and you look at the net outcome of the, the organization, you go, these people are stuck. And the, and paradoxically, at the very same time, these people are really smart, passionate, good humans. And so it got me thinking, it's like, why would smart, passionate, good humans be stuck? And ultimately, in a very basic level, I always thought it was fear. It's like the fear of the unknown. And it's so much safer. And I remember I used to show those two feet on, on that I got from... On, on the ice, but it's like this, this fear of the unknown paralyzes. And so I always thought that my role, which I failed miserably many times was to try and help people not fear the unknown, to try and help people get unstuck, which is why I'm, I'm doing this. And it takes a lot of leadership and it's not all the same because every organization, every dynamic is different. It's like, I know you're a student of leadership and I'd love to get your reflection of over your years and experience, the leadership lessons that you've learned to help organizations not get stuck through fear yeah. and through the concern of the unknown or self-preservation or whatever the motivations are, which are, you know, fundamentals. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that's such a spot on point. And, and I think, what I've come to realize having worked in an organization at all scales across verticals is, see, that mindset actually can come in any organization, even in startups. You know, the moment you start to see success, you want to protect it. Um, and it's not like people who work in those legacy businesses that are 150 year old aren't as smart as someone who's working in a startup. Of course not. Uh, you know, perhaps they're smarter. They built billions of dollars, you know, of market cap and value. The challenge is that like you said, the fear of the unknown is still lesser than the comfort of the known. You know, when e-commerce was coming on, it, it's not like people didn't see the numbers. E-com was growing 50x percent plus, but brick and mortar was still a trillion dollar industry, still growing at two, three percent. And they were OK because it was still comfortable up until the, the disruption became so big that you just could not sustain the comfort anymore. And I feel that the, the lesson that I've learned is you will not drive change through theoretical beliefs anymore, not at that scale. What you need to do to drive change is execution, is using the language that the business understands. Oftentimes I've seen marketeers struggle, especially in the last 10 years, as marketing evolved purely from emotional and soul purpose-driven marketing, which is very critical, unfortunately, to completely binary performance marketing. Where now, post-COVID, hopefully we've found a convergence where it's not an either or, it's an and. But I feel that a lot of times marketeers want to build brands, you know, and build that emotion. But they forget that we also have to prove the incrementality. We have to make sure that we are able to show the connectivity between brand and business, purpose and profitability, you know, science and storytelling. That These aren't either ors anymore. And that, that ability to prove all these things that we know and we believe matter, but ability to prove them with data, ability to prove them is short-term result and impact. I think that is the way you penetrate and drive change and, and that sheer execution. That's why I feel marketing today is a lot more than building the brand. It is building the underlying engine that ultimately, and you realize ultimately brand is the outcome. You know, it is not an input. It's not an output. It's, it's I, what happens at the end. I couldn't agree more. I mean, a couple of things. The, the world is littered with broken businesses and brands because of this binary thinking, number one. And number two, the pendulum swing of organizations. You know, I remember, I mean, I, I, I was raised to sell the notion and believe in the notion like, Build a brand, you'll create equity, and equity somehow will translate into dollars, right? Um, and I very quickly learned that that's not true. The reality is if you create experiences with the brand, 
that inspire someone to give you their money and feel really good about giving you your money, one of the consequential outcomes would be equity increases, brand gets more valuable. But it's like, I think the role of a commercial leader is to create an experience of the brand while taking a person's money where they feel like they got a bargain, where they feel, maybe not a bargain, but where they feel that that money spent was incredibly well spent. And I think that that's really important as like, whether it's content to commerce, um, however you define it, it, it ultimately it's about having someone leave this experience feeling like they spent some money and got more than what they gave in return. And that is marrying these two worlds. And it's interesting to me why, and I still haven't figured out why people and organizations sort of pendulum swing or think in binary terms. And I don't know if you have a point of view and why, but please, if you do, help me. It, <laughs> help it is, solve the problem. It, it is, it all boils down to the way we have, the way we businesses are organized and the way businesses operate. You know, we are organized in silos, we operate in silos. And most importantly, unfortunately, we incentivize in silos. Look, at the end, it's human behavior. But the moment you change the incentive, the moment you redefine success, not at a micro level, not by function by function, but you now aligned, su aligned success with shared outcomes. That's a whole different conversation. You know, it's not because when the outcomes aren't aligned, when someone's outcome and definition of success is saving costs, while somebody else's is driving 10x revenue, while somebody else's is build the brand, right there, these are different levers. And, and that's, that fragmentation leads to the pendulum shifts. In fact, that, that, that fragmentation leads to the friction where you now have a car with four wheels in four different directions. They're all moving with all the right intent, but it doesn't matter how great those wheels were, they're all going to churn. But then isn't that, you know, there's two points of view. One, well, there's three points. One is as executive leaders, C-level C leaders, our jobs are integrators more than anything else. One, two, the CMO arguably is not the CMO, they're the chief integrator, is another point of view. And the third point of view, and these are not binary constructs, is that in essence, the CEO's number one role is to ensure that the four wheels turn together. Um, I don't know what the relative ratio of those things are, but you know, as, as, as I think back about my experiences, and you and I experienced one where we had a C-level executive who was insecure and wanted to build her own machine at odds with where the company was going. And it was well in, you know, it was a, a good human who felt very insecure and needed to sort of feel good about what her and her organization was doing. And the consequence was quite disruptive. Um, have you seen an experience where the C team and the CEO and the CMO, in which in case would have been you, were more integrators and less individual operators trying to build their own empire, if you will. Yes. Uh, well, I, I must say I learned a lot through that experience and I learned a lot about what I, I could have and I would do differently if I were uh, replaying all of that all over again. And the first lesson that I've learned and also being a Buddhist is, uh, is, is that as leaders, you know, when you are in the C-suite, and let's say you're five of you, for example, you're not taking 25% responsibility for that shared outcome. You're taking every person takes 100% responsibility for the shared outcome. And I think I've seen that in great businesses. That's a mindset. That's a very subtle mindset shift. And when you do that, and when you build that rhythm, you are not worried about the boundaries. You know your strengths. So you know that where I'm going to lean on to the CFO or someone's going to lean on to the CTO. Um, but there is this, there is this extreme alignment towards the broader mission and the broader purpose. So the conversation is no longer about the micro KPIs. Those are important. You do that. But the conversation is all about the macro purpose and mission. And everyone is measured through the same set of KPIs. And that's the one big shift that I've seen. When you're, when you're measured based on different set of indicators and successes than your peer, then you really can't blame them. That's a model breakdown. So that's one part. There's another part that you, you mentioned, which is about the role of the CMO as a chief integrator or, or the orchestrator of the symphony, you know, or whatever other analogies. 
See, I feel, first of all, the role of the CMO is, is so diverse based on the business model itself. The CMO does command that position in a CPG because you have no option. You know, you are not engaging directly with the consumer. You are relying on a retail channel and and it's still spraying and praying to a great extent. Hey, build great stories. Hope that people get it. They walk on the aisle, they buy you. Okay, that's CPG, but that's not the reflection of majority of what the world is, which is very direct. And in that direct world, where the rest of the business believes in tangibility, attribution, you know, addressability, the marketing function and the CMO have to earn the right to be at the table every single day. Where you know you are in a battlefield, and rightly so, because amongst all functions, marketing is the only function that has been disrupted most in the last 15 years because you know it was very old school back back in the day and i feel that in that's when you're operating in that space the the cmo should be the chief orchestrator and the integrator and the strongest advocate for the customer but you can't take that for granted it doesn't happen unfortunately not in most cases where you are still on the back foot trying to prove the incrementality of marketing trying to even just prove that no 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 you deserve to be on the table and the only way you do that, I feel, is when you define growth at the intersection of growing and building that cultural brand, but alongside the flywheel of growing and building that user base, alongside the flywheel of growing and building the user value. You know, those three flywheels, not one, not two, the three flywheels, and you, you challenge yourself to operate at that intersection. Sorry, I was. I'm going on mute because, as I told you, we've we've, we've got the practicing for the Air Chicago Air and Water Show, and I've got uh, a bunch of Blue Angel jets flying over the building here. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and it's a nuance. It's it's a, again, it, there's a construct, and then there's an industry construct, and then there's the humans involved. And it, you know, we're not going to solve it today. But I do want to shift gears a little bit because I, you and I have not talked since you joined Kraken. And so I would love to, hey, let's talk about Kraken. Like, what is Kraken for the three people who haven't heard about it? And what excited you about them? And then let's talk a little bit about where we see the category growing, where the, where we see the industry growing, because it's in a very much sort of nascent part of its journey, at least in my very limited knowledge perspective. So talk to me about Kraken. Yes, well, first, very excited and, and again, grateful to be here. I've been here now four and a half months. Um, well, Kraken is one of the largest um, crypto exchanges in the world, now diversifying ourselves into being a marketplace. We've announced our NFT marketplace coming up soon. Um, we have other products as well that go beyond uh, just being an exchange and a lot of innovation coming downstream. Um, it's one of the oldest exchanges since 2011. We've just celebrated our 11th year. So we've, we've, we've been through a lot and, uh, um, you know, being led by some incredible co-founders and our CEO, Jesse Powell, you know, who's one of the crypto OGs. Um, you know, Jesse and I started talking late last year. One thing led to the other, took around, you know, four or five months and finally felt um, I was ready to go back in, in high tech. Um, I, I've been in, I personally had been in crypto since 2016, um, got really deep in 17, got out of it in 2019, uh, very immature move, uh, but not ashamed of it, and then got back in again in 2020. Um, firm believer in the value and the impact and the future uh, that the category brings. I feel that um, if there is one category, which is um, a blank canvas and, and one of the best categories to be a marketer, it is crypto. And here's why, because for a change, you're not just building the brand, uh, you're building the category. You know, um, I feel that when big revolution and innovation happens, the only way you drive global adoption is um, when technology is invisible and the value is very easily visible, you know, it overshadows. And I was thinking about some examples. Um, you know, if you think about when iOS and, and the iPhone came about. Nobody cared about what the underlying tech was. The value was so obvious and just rapid fire. Even something as simple as Uber, nobody cared about, was Uber using uh, the, the Google map as a technology or was using their own? It didn't matter. You know, the value was so obvious. And in neither of these cases, 
did anybody ever ask, oh, I need the yellow cab model isn't working. We need to disrupt. You know, somebody saw it. I feel crypto is a massive, massive opportunity to totally change how we live our lives, you know, access to financial and, and economic freedom across the globe, agnostic of where you live. However, the journey that we have to now take is to hide the technology and make the value more visible to more tangible. And, and the reason why I said it's, it's, a, it's an incredible haven for marketers is the journey in the next 10 years will be all about humanizing this incredible piece of technology, which can still be very intimidating, opaque, black boxish, but with a lot of power underneath. So I'm, I'm very bullish, very excited. Uh, and uh, and couldn't be more excited than working on a brand and business like Kraken that's seen a lot of ups and downs, but it's still one of the most trusted platforms in the category. It's interesting. I, I, I'm sure the vast majority of people didn't don't know that it's been around for 11 years, which sort of gets to my point, which you touched on is there's the technology and then there's the, the value it, the, it brings and how it can change your life and all the things you talked about. But in between those two is the lack of understanding and the fear of um, not sure is you know, it's, it's more than anything else. I'd say a sort of a trust issue. It's like, and so I'm sure that's central to what you're doing. And I, and I say this against a backdrop of I'm almost embarrassed to to, to say this, but in 2007, late 2007, probably a senior executive told me that e-commerce we were making a case just before you came um to scale up e-commerce from 100 million give or take because we didn't really measure it to a billion dollars billion dollars in e-commerce in three years which we did or four years and a senior executive said to me this thing will never scale because the brick and mortar customer won't let it happen and i was like i i, I couldn't believe these words were coming out of this person's mouth let alone anyone's mouth um and so in, in a way, there's a bit of a parallel because you're in an early stage in a category um, that's sort of quite volatile to the layman, um, a little bit of the unknown, a little bit of the black box, as you said, and therefore, consequentially, I'm not sure I can trust. And this is not about, you know, buying a box of cereal or, or a diaper and the cost of failure is not as high, right? So how do you deal with that? Because that's an, like, for me, that's a super exciting challenge. I'd be like, Put me in coach but there's consequential outcomes of that yes it's and and these are these are great problems to solve but very important ones and and quintessential ones because until we solve these uh, you know that that vision and the mission that many big crypto brands have won't be accomplished and the way you solve that i feel is first of all is we have the responsibility to highlight and and go in not with the solution but very importantly with the problem that we're trying to solve. See, because like I said, it's if the value isn't obvious, people don't yet understand what is wrong in the current ecosystem. What is wrong with the trad fi, the traditional financial institutions? What is wrong with traditional money? What is wrong with US dollar being the global currency for the world, the reserve currency for the world? We don't know that. We don't understand that. And I'll be very honest. I, I didn't understand that for, for many, many, many years of my life until very recently, because it is not taught in academia. So in a, in a category that is trying to change the status quo of something that we've been made to believe is good for decades and decades, the journey begins by first highlighting very tangibly on what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Right now, what's happened is we've gone in with the solution and people are just wondering, okay, it's cool, but what is it changing in my life? So that's what I mean by humanizing this great technology, humanizing crypto by making it relevant in terms of simple use cases for the person walking down the street. And then you, you first bring them in and get them curious about, oh, I didn't know that it could solve it. I didn't know that NFTs is not just about you know, tokenizing your art. NFTs can be actually used to authenticate your birth certificates, which is a huge challenge in countries like India and many others, not in the US, but there's so many countries in the world where authentic documentation for your property, for your real estate, for your for your birth certificate, for your degree is a massive challenge. It's a and it's a multi multi billion dollar industry in itself. How much money do we spend every year transferring money from one market, one country to the other? 
There are so many real use cases that are not being highlighted. But the good news is that as more dApps come out, decentralized application, this is the early stages of what happened with iOS. See, the phone was, iOS was launched without the app store. Real adoption happened when it eventually became a platform. So, and that is where we Because are. it broadened the application and made it more real and tangible. And, and started to solve problems. problems that you and I live every day. It, it was no longer just my personal device that was that I could use to send text messages or you know or access the internet. It actually solved a million number of tangible use cases that, by the way, I wasn't thinking about. I wasn't waking up in the morning thinking about all these apps or gaps that I had in my life until they came and they showed me value. And now we can't live without it. So I'm going to, since I represent, you know, the, the average Neanderthal, how, how, would, how would I immerse myself? Because, you know, as you know, my whole ethos is like, I'm on a continual learning journey. So when I'm not learning, I'm, I'm super destabilized. And this is a part of the world that I've started like getting more and more intimate with and trying to learn and trying to understand. How would you recommend uh, people who are listening to jump into this world and get more articulate about more understanding and, and, and open up their brains versus wait for, you know, because my view is when something like this happens, you got to jump on the train and run to the front um, or you're going to be left behind. And yeah, there may be a cost to it, but education ain't cheap. So two, three things that you'd have me do as the average Neanderthal. Well, first of all, know that we're all doing it. Um, we, we are all learning this. So we are all taking different seats on the train. Some people did that 10, 11 years back and we call them the crypto OGs. But I can assure you 10 years later, 15 years later, we'll all be crypto OGs, uh, you know, for the next generation who will be born into it. But um, I often tell, this is a journey that I took. I often tell everyone, don't worry about and don't speculate the price of a certain currency. See, that's the surface of this technology. First, understand what is the basics and the foundation, which is a blockchain, or what is that? And there are a lot of great content. You can find that on Kraken.com. We have a learn center, but there are a lot of other great content as well. But definitely check out uh, the Kraken Learn Center and the Kraken blog, where we talk about, and we will do more and more of that. Our big mission is to educate users who are not into crypto, who are curious about it, and tell them, explain to them the key complex concepts in very simple ways. The Albert Einstein quote, you know, if you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. So we have to live by it. But I would say, first, let's understand uh, the foundation of blockchain. What is it? And the way I will explain to anybody is just imagine is the world's database that has certain traits, not owned by anybody, totally decentralized, hence the world's database, not owned by anyone, immutable. You can't go back and change it. But everyone has access to it. Literally, everyone has access to it. So you no longer, if you're hospital A and hospital B, you don't have two systems. And you're trying to say, no, if, if ever that were to happen, it's all in the world's database. Now, of course, it comes at a cost. So a lot of innovation happening to reduce the cost to process. But that's, that's blockchain, the, the visibility and transparency. And, and that's why there are a lot of misconceptions which are laughable. Like, we, you know, there's a misconception that, oh, the transactions that happen in crypto, you know, are, is like a black box. On the contrary, anything that happens on crypto can never be changed. It's right there. Now, it may be anonymous, but it's tied to a wallet, et cetera. So without getting- so it's visible. visible. It's visible. It's absolutely visible. Now, unchangeable. Yes, it is not changeable. It's Now, you may hide it. You may hide behind it, so you may not use your wallet again. But someday when you do it, we'll tie it. Compare that to cash. It's mutable. There's no, it's fungible, right? The, there is no difference between your dollar and mine. One is gone, it's gone. So I, I always encourage, start from those basics into what is blockchain. And, and then second layer is not all crypto is the same. Not all cryptocurrencies are trying to solve the same problem. There are some that are trying to be a medium of exchange. And there are some like Ethereum, which is actually the world's supercomputer. It's an ecosystem. It's not just a currency. It has, it has a whole middle layer, which is very much like 
a programming language like Java, where you are built or iOS. You know, people are there. there are so many companies and so many people building great apps on top of that ecosystem. So I think that's when you start to really understand what problems are these different companies trying to solve. And the tokenization is very much like, you know, in, in the more traditional model, you're buying stock in companies. A lot of that is that. So it's not all just about launching new coins and you should speculate. These are solving real world problems underneath. And the more we understand that, the more we will realize, have beliefs or not, have questions on what the future will be. It's it, it, it's so important, and, and it's not I, part of looking forward to this conversation. But we'll have to have a whole another session on this alone. But part of the reason I was looking forward to it, other than catching up because it's been a while, is to start unpack this. And, and I think people do just based on my small end of thirty or forty or whatever tend to think of it more as a, as a currency in trading and less as a, a much broader platform and ecosystem that has a bunch of utility um, across the thing. And I think there is a massive opportunity for education. I mean, in the sense is the players in the space have a shared accountability to build a category through knowledge and transparency and education versus fighting for share uh, and revenue in the space, which is maybe a naive thought, but certainly I, I, those don't have to be binary constructs. But I, I do believe that that's a big, big opportunity. It's huge, and and um, and until we do that, we are we are talking past each other, each other, and and past the consumers. You know, we are we are saying, look what we got, and and they're saying, okay, I see it, but I don't know what it does. You know, so. So totally. And, and uh, I think if, if you and I reconnect, we'll obviously reconnect many times. But if we did reconnect this time next year, I would love to get feedback on if, if we and I'm sure others, too, if we made progress in, in bringing this and making crypto more real, more human uh, and more understood before we say more adopted. Right. Well, there's no doubt that that's going to happen. And as you know, like I've experienced in, in a different place on e-com and we were, that was way, way further down the, the development curve, but it, it happens, it's inevitable um, and it's an uneven journey, right? In, 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 but, it, but boy, it's an interesting journey. Um, we will definitely talk sooner than a year from now. Uh, and at some point, I think you should come back and let's just talk crypto in, 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 in the category at a much more granular level but we're at time as always my friend it's a delight to see you uh and i can see you although we don't broadcast uh visuals we only do voice and that's because of me not because of my guest because no one wants to look at me but as always uh an absolute joy catching up with you the journey continues and, and as is your trademark it continues to be exciting interesting and breakthrough so thanks for giving up the time my friend Thanks, Clive. Glad to be here. This podcast was brought to you by Screen Dragon. We break down barriers, make workflow, and unlock talent. Visit ScreenDragon.com to see our software in action.